this is what he has translated to mean the Nephites and the Lamanites. What? Yeah. And so what's really cool about Wait, we this, can we gotta we gotta we can start tagging Nephites and <laughs> Lamanites. And there's interesting things going on with the numbers in the way that they fit both Egyptian and Mayan. Figure out which one of these glyphs is the silly it and it came to pass glyph. And I gotta tell you, F Guardian actually kind of looks a little bit more like the deformed English that anti-Mormons say. Exactly. You know I mean? <laughs> this is what that would look like. So one thing he was able to say about these uh, characters in this character's document is it appears to be a logographic writing system. And nobody <laughs> likes feeling like they're freaking stupid for believing something. Mm -hmm. So whenever these there there's these evidences that come out, I don't know why the church doesn't just push these out. <laughs> Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to Ward Radio. I am your host, Carnellis, and today I'm joined in the studio by Brad Whitbeck. Hey. BT Whitbeck, Apostle 2024. Y'all should vote for him. Nope, no, don't no, bring it closer. Don't bring it Push closer. Push that thing back. <laughs> Push that back. Yeah. Push that back. <laughs> All right, well, you know, there's a lot of people out there that say the... Um, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints truth claim that uh, the Golden Plates or the Book of Mormon was translated from Reformed Egyptian is just a bunch of bunk. And there's a lot of a lot of controversy surrounding this document right here, formerly known as the Characters Document, which is a supposed recreation of some of the symbols that were on those gold plates. And for years, anti-Mormons have made a very vicious claim that we will put on your screen here that supposedly... Instead of Reformed Egyptian, many of the characters are deformed English, as anyone will observe who will compare them with English letters, figures, and signs. This being an excerpt from the book Camorra Revisited by Charles A. Shook, 1910. Okay, so is Reformed Egyptian actually just a bunch of deformed English? We've all been bamboozled by a con man in the 1830s. Or if you dig deeper, is there a little bit more? Well, Brad Whitbeck here gets all the credit he's brought us a super interesting study and publication and some of the uh in-depth research that has been put into this reformed egyptian namely this new book okay about the translation of the characters document accompanied by some super cool insight from our boy robert boylan that says this ain't deformed english apparently people say reformed egyptian isn't a thing but it is a thing so uh brad Tell us how it's a thing. So here's the deal. I, I was studying this character's document recently and was fascinated to find if there were any translations of it that anyone had done. And I found something really cool. The credit for this goes to a guy named Jerry Grover. Okay, who rock on. has gone through... He's That's this guy right here, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, this, rock on. this character's document that he's put together. Um, he's got all of these characters highlighted, right, in these different colors. Yeah. Those are showing the ones that he has found a good match for within hieratic Egyptian, which is a really? type of uh, writing system of Egyptian, and I think also Demotic, and then some like Mayan influences that he's pulled together and Hebrew as well. So he's really, yeah, he's pulling from all of the sources that would be influencing what reformed Egyptian would probably end up looking like. Right. And he's found some really fascinating matches. Really? Yeah. So, okay. This, this is really, really cool. The stuff that he's gone through now, do you want to start with Robert Boylan or dive into the Jerry Grover stuff? Well, uh, uh, Robert Boylan's probably a little bit simpler. Yeah, uh, just be, let, let's and, start and, with and that. a little bit snarky. I'll be honest with you. His like <laughs> Irishness is coming across there. What? You know, like I, I, I could just I could just hear the Irish as I read his uh, his uh, his, um, you know, his not talk to text. That's what cell phones do. But mm -hmm. as I envision him narrating his own uh, blog, uh -huh. I just I just I just hear the angry Irishman coming out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So anyway, um, yeah, just show us, uh, show us uh, Robert so, Boylan's research, and then we'll go back to this Jerry Grover guy. Yeah. So this is in response to the like deformed English in the Anthon transcript. So if you pull up this. Okay. Uh, uh, he's got it on his blog post. Scroll down just a little bit. He's got a comparison. And now this is a actual like demotic Egyptian written out. And what's fascinating, that thing we looked at earlier, yeah. showing calling 
uh, the characters deformed English. What they did is they went through and they grabbed different characters from the characters document. They turned them different ways and tried to put them like flip them upside down so that when inverted, they made them look a whole lot like English. Yeah, so right? we can look at the anti-Mormon claim right here. So I'm not misrepresenting anybody. The website is called mistinsunday.com, and this is supposedly stuff you missed in Sunday school. Here's the character's document, a beautiful high-resolution uh, image. And they're trying to say that, like, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and zero are s and A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K are the, are the slow uh, deformations that ultimately result in reformed Egyptian as represented on the character's document, right? Yeah. And consistent with rule number 17 of the first 30 rules of anti-Mormons, they always recycle old lies or else it has the rule number uh, 12, the thin veneer of um, academia mm -hmm. without la uh, while lacking the verifiability. Yes, of because as presented, this looks like a, oh, wow. Those are so similar. We've been bamboozled. We've we've just been we've been tricked. Yeah. But here's what happens when you take actual demotic Egyptian. Take pull up. So here's the actual that like. demotic Egyptian. Okay. So this is from Robert Boylan's blog. We give him credit. This is the actual demotic Egyptian right there, mm -hmm. which was, um, if I understand correctly, from Jim Gee and other researchers, there was hieratic and there was demotic Egyptian that was generally scribal. It wasn't the stuff etched in stone, but the stuff written on papyri that was oftentimes royal commands. If the pharaoh said, "I want you to send three thousand cows down to the kingdom of Cush." You know what I'm saying? Somebody was writing that uh, scribally and then was executing those claims. And so there had to be a handwritten version of Egyptian in conjunction with the stuff that's etched in stone. Am I correct? Or yeah, I it's a and it's basically a simplified form. Right. OK. So um, what's cool is Robert found someone else who had done this. I can't remember the name of the guy, but he has taken the exact demotic Egyptian. OK. And done the same thing. That they did with the yes. deformed English. So here's the demotic Egyptian. And now let's go back to the original blog post. And so he, I'll just read what he says. Flipping the letters around and matching up the characters, the English letters, as some, as some have done over the years, also proves absolutely nothing reg with regard to whether or not the badly copied multi-generational copies in the extant manus manuscript frag fraction fragment, I'm sorry, I can't read, are derived from the Egyptian characters. He shows the demotic here and he says, now, for the English sentence made with some of the above demotic characters, and this is savage, he takes real demotic, he takes real demotic Egyptian, and I'm going to blow this up so everybody can see it, and oh my gosh, you can read it. Demotic and is really deformed English. <laughs> <laughs> That's that awesome. It's so savage. That's awesome. They they just used the exact method that they used to disprove what was written on the characters document, right? I, I mean, this is absolutely insane. I mean, you need to look at I'm I'm just going to do this side by side. I'm going to pull up the browser, okay? This is demotic Egyptian characters simply manipulated and rotated enough so that when you look at them, look, oh my gosh, it literally says, demotic is really reformed English. Deformed like, English, or yeah. Or deformed English. Mm -hmm. Like, that is so bad. Yeah. And, and, and see, that's the thing, it is on its face, I can see why that might bother you. But when you look any further to verify any of this, it's like, oh, Maybe that's not the best way to disprove what's on that character's document, right? Like this is, and, and by the way, interesting thing about the character's document. Um, so where it actually comes from is it was a document that was had by the RLDS church for a while. And um, they've done handwriting analysis and it looks like it's John Whitmer who interesting. Okay. copied that over. So um, we know that Joseph Smith copied some of these uh, characters down for the Anthon transcript that was taken to Charles Anthon. This character's document is most likely not what was taken to Charles Anthon, right? Yeah. Um, but which is a common misconception, just like there's uh, uh, cultural misconceptions that like the Hill Cumorah pageant is on like what the Hill Cumorah is in New York. You know, yeah, yeah. we so, don't know if that's the Hill Cumorah, right? But <laughs> and also this, uh, we know Reformed Egyptian is the claim. 
and that there is the characters document out there, which is supposedly somehow tangentially related to the characters that were on the gold plates. But that's not the Anthon transcript that Anthon saw. Mm -hmm. OK. And, and, and so this is what we have from John Whitmer, where he's copying down what Joseph Smith had written down. Right. So okay. we also don't know to what degree he made mistakes with that. Right. Yeah. So now we're looking at a copy of a copy of what was originally inscribed into the plates. Both done by people that never understood the original language that were making the copies post Joseph Smith. Exactly. It's like when I have tried to copy down Greek for my buddies that are doing Near Eastern studies and anybody that speaks Spanish knows that even the smallest nuances absolutely botch it. Uh -huh. In Spanish, if you want to say, I have a message of Jesus Christ for you, you say, tengo un mensaje de Jesucristo para usted. If you actually um, accidentally say, Masaje instead of mensaje, you uh, end up offering on behalf of Jesus Christ a massage. You know what I'm saying? Oh, and no. So like, yeah, there's <laughs> there's all kinds of small little details here that are very important that I'm sure could have gotten muffed. So we're not saying that the character's document is some kind of indelible proof of a very specific type of Hebrew infused reformed Egyptian and so on and so forth. We are simply saying that the brain damaged, cruel and uh, uh, recycled trope <laughs> that we've been all just bamboozled by a con man. And there's no way that reformed Egyptian could exist. And that, by the way, reformed Egyptian is just a formed English. Well, that doesn't hold water either. Well, you know? it's not necessarily brain damaged. I can see how a reasonable person would arrive at that conclusion if they were bothered by it, right? Like, I can see I can somebody. See how an innocent victim of a wolf jumping out of the bushes in sheep's clothing <laughs> might actually see that these people that recycle these tropes are not just reasonable folks who are walking along the street one day and thought, hmm, that reformed Egyptian, I want to investigate the claim of reformed Egyptian. No, just type in reformed Egyptian into Google and it's a bunch of rabid psychopath anti Mormons trying to make a bunch of crazy oh claims my against gosh, us. So okay. here's the thing, whether or not there's malicious intent involved or not, it, there's something really cool going on with what Jerry Grover was able to do with the characters document. Okay? Yes, yes. So let's pull back up what he had here. Um, okay. This is super cool. He was able to look at this and he worked as a translator for a really long time. Um, he speaks English. He speaks Italian. He speaks Chinese. Whoa. And is like he's a really bright dude. Okay. Um, he's actually a geologist. Like he's he's got a lot of different fields going on for him. Um, but um, one thing that he was able to do is he's gone through and looked at these. Uh, go at the very top. Okay, I was about to say, how many pages is this? This is four hundred over four hundred pages, like four hundred forty pages. Jeez, and it's okay, awesome work. And it doesn't look like he's had very much. Um, of any interaction with this. He put it out in 2015 and no one's really followed up on it too much, but look at these. He's highlighted. This is all crazy. Of like I, I've never heard of this until you mentioned it. And then I look it up and it's on scripture web scripture scripture. There's a link. If you Google it buried in scripture central, why are we having again, the Thomas B Marsh bucket of cream story 17 times. And not this. Imagine well, an elder's hey, form lesson fair, where we busted this out, bro. <laughs> that would be awesome. But to be fair, no one should be basing their testimony off of the character's document, right? No, but showing that there, that like faith cannot exist in a place that is not logically plausible or whatever that quote is from Jacob Hansen. Mm. You know, that, 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 that the Lord, though he does require faith, he doesn't require stupidity. And, and, and nobody <laughs> likes feeling like they're freaking stupid for believing something. Mm -hmm. So whenever these there, there's these evidences that come out, I don't know why the church doesn't just push these out into the to the forefront more because it's like wow this this well, show is holy smoke i, I think part of the reason why is because the critical community would be so much more rabid about a single mistake made Right. So, so again, it, the bureaucrats are making sure that the anti-Mormons are content. Like, we, we don't want to proclaim our truth because no, 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 it no. might it anger our enemies. We don't want to have a battle out there in the public mind in which, hey, science proves that the LDS church is true. And then, hey, guess what? When science progresses, as science is wont to do, okay. turns out those suppositions that we had weren't entirely correct. They may not also be entirely false, but now, hey, there's a blow up that we can have people look at and be like, oh, it was wrong. And now I've based my testimony on it's way easier for people's testimonies to not have them being pushed by the church uh, for, for the church to not be pushing all of these things that could then be 
wrong in a minor way, but then people have based their testimony on that portion, right? Does that make sense? Yes, it does. But I, w I will defend my thesis that we should be more vocal about this thing because Jim Gee mentioned this. Uh, it, Jim Gee found the maps of Nahom, all right? We're, we're talking definitive evidence that there was this caliphate that is mentioned uniquely in the uh, in the Book of Mormon that could not have been so, some plagiarized thing. And, and, and the church writes like one article in BYU Studies in like 1996 and then never, never talks about it. But it, it's it's the maps of Nahom. Like, it, this could do so much good, mm -hmm. okay? <clears throat> and it's it's such powerful evidence uh, and and i just google right now characters document i'm, I'm going to show you in real time mm -hmm. how how much better this could be i just googled characters document translation study guide pdf and here's oh, oh book of mormon central all right so we click on it read the these are the most conservative mormon scholars on the freaking planet that never go out of their way to make anything any kind of claim that could get lambasted later on. You know what yeah. I'm saying? These guys take zero risks in their claims on, you know, Book of Mormon archaeology and true claims and this and that because they, they try and be hyper academic, right? And even these cats, the least risk takers on the freaking planet, all right, say the abstract of this book that you're about to show us all is a small scrap of paper entitled Characters that contained characters copied from the plates from which the Book of Mormon was translated have remained an enigma for more than a hundred years. Finally, the characters have been successfully translated. In a book that is the first of its kind, Jerry Grover, a professional civil engineer, geologist, and translator, has been able to crack the code of the reformed Egyptian. The author's approach is meticulous and scientific. This is a landmark of event in Book of Mormon studies and is a book that must be ready read by every serious student of the Book of Mormon and of Mesoamerican studies. The author is dedicating all proceeds from the book to additional scientific studies to cast further light on the ancient studies of the Book of Mormon. If there's something out there and I'm a member of the 12 apostles or I'm in the Sunday school presidency or I'm in the young men's presidency and I want to make sure that people have a testimony that is based both off of fact and off of revelation, don't you think a landmark event right. in Book of Mormon studies that, quote, cracks the code by an authority on the subject who's a geologist, a civil engineer, and a translator would be worth repeating ad nauseum. So <laughs> you know? here, if I were to put myself in their shoes and try to think about where they're coming from, my guess is that their reasoning goes something like this. The people who care about this kind of thing are going to look for it and find it. Because it's out here on Scripture Central, right? It's the kind of thing they can find. They don't need to put it out there yet because even though this abstract is very confident in what it's saying, um, it is still a work in progress, right? Was like, the Samaritan woman at the well looking for I, Jesus? I, I want to finish. Come to I want to finish this part. No, because you're defending these people. No, no, no. Because <laughs> because Jerry Grover has. I, I found him on Reddit talking to people about this he's actually been super active in interfacing really? with people yeah okay Pe people like asking about asking questions about this uh, he's done a bunch of threads like explaining his process and things he's totally open Let's to get him figuring on. out further we absolutely should okay. um, he's open to refining this seeing fact checking it seeing what's going on with it getting it more well um proven right yeah and and i think it's in a really really good spot from what i've read so far it looks really awesome right okay but I, but i don't think they're necessarily at the point where they want to be like hey everybody in the church look at this this is factually 100 percent right right so uh, his invitation from what it appears to be what i've seen on reddit and kind of how it goes throughout the book is like here is what he's seen in like legit egyptian dictionaries and in what's what we know of the Mayan language and in these legitimate, like scholarly sources that he goes through. And like this abstract says, he systematically shows exactly where in other dictionaries he's getting his comparisons for and shows them. And I, I want to go over one or two of these. Oh, um, I was about going to say you took the words right out of my mouth. I said, you know, unfortunately, we always have a hard out coming up pretty soon. So what are like the top? two, maybe three things that kind of blew your mind because this is what blew my mind. I looked at this abstract, mm -hmm. came out in 2015, bro. Yeah. I've never heard of Jerry Grover mm -hmm. until you talked to me about this today. Mm -hmm. And I, I doubt the average layman has. And if it's as 
you know, awesome as you say it is, how have we waited eight years mm -hmm. to get a hold of this and talk to this cat? To be fair, as soon as I started researching characters, document I don't want translation, to be I fair. found it. I don't want to be fair. I want to justify <laughs> my anger and annoyance and personify it in somebody else okay. <laughs> and then shift my personal responsibility onto them and then through repetitive confirmation bias online, mm -hmm. assume that my way is the correct way and I should have total control over the situation so it's done better next time. That sounds like a very healthy way to move forward. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, okay. So um, I think uh, let's pull up the document. This is yeah. super cool. I, I want to just go over something Kay. he leads off with. Um, in, from his work in translation, he's been able to figure out a couple of things around like writing systems and okay. um, especially like with Chinese versus English. They're very different writing systems, right? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so one thing he was able to say about these uh, characters in this character's document is it appears to be a logographic writing system. So what that means is okay. it's not like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, okay. right? Like they're not writing out words with every letter symbolizing a sound. These are what looks to be more of a logographic thing where there is a uh, like almost a hieroglyphic picture that has a meaning associated with that. Glyph, yeah, it's like right? if you read Mandarin um, or Cantonese scrolls that date back thousands of years or on... Egyptian hieroglyphics. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like television is firebox. Exactly. Yeah, so okay. this does a couple of cool things. Number one, there are people who will get um, up in arms about how, hey, the plates weren't big enough to contain the full Book of Mormon, right? Yeah. Like, you, you couldn't have fit the entire thing there. And it's like, well, if it's a logographic writing system, that becomes a lot easier. You're writing in a much more condensed space, and that actually fits with things written in the Book of Mormon. Yeah, how he, like, was trying to conserve space yeah. on the plates. That yeah. You have, I think, more than one writer in the Book of Mormon talk about how they are trying to conserve space in what they're writing and trying to write the most precious and of things. And the difficulty of writing on plates. Yes, exactly. Okay. So there's some really interesting things in there that seem to support what Jerry's saying here. Now, bring back up the picture because this is a really cool thing. Okay. He, he starts noting some really cool similarities uh, between some stuff going on with Egyptian calendar and Mayan calendar stuff because he started by recognizing numbers in this. And Intr what numbers? Numbers, yeah. Whoa, and realizing okay. this is talking about calendars. So bring it back up. It says okay. Mormon's chronological summary of the period from the 19th regnal year of the reign of Mosiah to the coming of the Limhites and Mormon's synopsis of the Book of Mormon prophetic calendar. Right? Okay. So he's noticing these numbers in there and starts recognizing some things. So I, I'm just going to read through quickly what they are. Leave this up. In, in fact, let's maybe just pull up the entire document so people can see it a little bit better. Okay, cool. And put it just boom. like Yeah, that. just okay. like that. Rock so on. as people are looking at this, here's what's awesome. You have a breakdown of the patterns that are found in the document that Jerry found here. Okay. And um, in red... He's got calendar initial series introductory glyphs. So he's identified a thing where like these glyphs appear to be introduced, introducing the fact that it's showing you a calendar, right? Okay, sick. Blue is numbers and numerical date sequences. And that's including indicators like year and month glyphs, right? Okay, rock on. And, and so he's getting this from Egyptian and from Mayan. And when you go through the full 400 page book, he shows you in those dictionaries where he's finding all of these correlations, right? And yeah. what he thinks looks like the right lineup. Next is the purple ones that he's got here. Okay, awesome. Th those are distance number indicator glyphs. Wow, okay. So, so they're showing like uh, some of the distances in the Book of Mormon, Some something that he goes through in here. It's really fascinating. The way that they are using north, south, east, and west are fascinating. They're, some of them are like coming across as something more like upriver. Right. Oh, okay. And, and cool, so there's cool. yeah, there's yeah. things where in the Book of Mormon it makes sense why hey, we're talking about going up or down isn't necessarily north or south. It could be up river. It could be down. It's, yeah, yeah. It's okay. an interesting thing. Just like the old Jewish terminologies, if I remember correctly, of the Isles of the Sea, met a place that was traveled to by boat, not necessarily an island in the sea. Oh, interesting. I didn't yeah. know about that. Yeah. So like you could travel literally from like Tyre to Sidon, which are both on the coast, if I remember correctly. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that would be considered an island of the sea, even though both were on the Mediterranean coast. Oh, fascinating. So yeah. So anyway, keep going. Yeah. So then he's got... Um, green is posterior date indicator glyphs. So like it ends 
the date indicator thing. And then orange, anterior date indicator glyphs, and pink, period ending or translation glyph. Interesting. So he goes through what all of these things mean in the 400-page document. But it's super cool that he was able to start identifying what some of these things meant. And it, it looks like he started off by recognizing some of these as numbers. And there's interesting things going on with the numbers in the way that they fit both Egyptian and Mayan. And also, anybody that says that this is deformed Egyptian, I, I just think, how stupid do you think you are or your fellow man is? <laughs> All right? Because, like, look at this. Look at this one right here. <laughs> no. <laughs> See this one that looks kind of like a four, but then with that weird little curly Q on the top? It's like, do you really think that somebody was out there thinking, I'm just going to write a four? And add a curly Q. It ain't nobody going to notice. Nobody's going to notice. Fact, do you know what's an interesting study in this? Yeah, what? Uh, the Kinderhook plates. Oh, Do you want to know really? part of how they figured out the uh, Kinderhook plates were just made up in a forgery? How? Part of the reason is none of those characters actually end up really repeating. Right? Oh. They just kind of scribbled stuff. They happened to scribble some actual glyphs, right? Like the okay. boat looking one that turns out to mean yeah. from the loins of ham, descendant of Pharaoh, that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. Um, but there's like, I think there's almost no real uh, re repetition in what's going on there. But you've got some re repeaters here. Do, do we have, can we figure out which one of these glyphs is the silly it, and it came to pass glyph? <laughs> oh, I'm not sure. I, I I haven't, so I haven't read the entire thing yet. Maybe, I don't know if in, and it came to pass is in here yet. Um, okay. But I do want to go go on to page, uh, where is this? Page 189 okay, in this. Okay, I'm cruising down. Because this was one of my favorite things. I was just kind of scrubbing through this quickly, trying to see what those things were that I saw that I, that I thought were cool and interesting and things that I liked. And down around page 189, he has a really interesting... Uh, is it 189... Of okay, because the the numbers on the PDF are not the same as the numbers on. So do you mean one eighty nine of the PDF or one eighty nine of the of, pages of the numbered pages of the, the number pages? Yeah. In the book. Okay. Cool. So here's one eighty four. Man, dude, look, this is prolific, dude. Yeah. Jeez, Louise. And okay, back up a little bit. Yeah. Here we go. Okay. So look at that. Those characters that we have on screen right now. This is super interesting. Okay. Um, this is what he has translated to mean the Nephites and the Lamanites. What? Yeah. And so, what's really cool about wait, we this, can we gotta we gotta we can start tagging Nephites <laughs> and Lamanites. We can start doing freaking straight up LDS graffiti. Maybe. Maybe. Oh, dude, this is like the sharks and the jets. So, but like in hieratic <laughs> Egyptian. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is what we need to look for. Layman graffitiing. Layman was here 600 BC. That's right? what I'm saying. Like, that's what we're looking for. Um, but when you look at this, this is really fascinating. He goes through and explains how these line up in an interesting way. That you have the Nephites on the right hand side of a character referring to God. And the Lamanites are on the left-hand side of that character referring to God. Oh. So on the right hand of God, the left hand of God, right? God's chosen people are on his right hand. Those are the Nephites in this glyph, right? Okay. And the Lamanites are the ones that do not choose God. Oh. This lines up really well with a lot of the ways that the Book of Mormon actually talks about these. You have this in Jacob. He talks about how, hey, we're just going to refer to the unbelievers as Lamanites, right? Yeah. And those who are antagonistic to the people of Nephi. And yeah. so this is a really fascinating way that this seems to line up with what Jerry Grover has discovered here. And so this is a super cool way that like, oh, hey, even in the writing of it, they're referring back to their relationship with God. Can this guy start doing like a podcast with like Emily Bell Freeman or that dude that always buttons his top button? And can that get popular? Dude, so I, so I found a podcast of him talking with, I think, Rick Bennett. Um, on gospel tangents because I've seen a s bunch of super cringe come follow me's that I think would be a lot better if we're like straight up showing the hieroglyphics of like what the Nephites and Lamanites you know might have it would be awesome right logo graphically yeah <laughs> so I, I think I would love to do a more deep dive into this with Jerry Grover on if we could get him because um, one thing I don't want to do is take my imperfect understanding of all the research he did and then yeah. put out stuff because I'm sure I've already made a mistake in here somewhere along the line. Um, but I, d I don't want us to be the ones presenting 
all the way through what he's had in his 400 Dude, we're page gonna, book. We're going to get him on. In fact, before we get him on, what we'll do is we're just going to have to defer our audience to this to this document here. That we is, should link this in the description of the yeah, video. Yeah. We're going to link this in the description of the video. And what we'll do, I guess, is we'll just start out and say, hey, this is a cursory overview. But Jerry Grover, you're invited to come on, my man. Uh, you know, we'll put you up in a hotel here in Los Angeles and you, you, you got to bring the, bring your a game, uh, to, uh, the ward radio jungle and tell us all of your really, really cool insights without boring us to death because dog, you did write a 400 page PDF. You know what now, I'm saying? I mean, that's like right up there with Jim Bennett's response to the CES letter. It's like, dog, I want to write it, but if I'm going to read 400 pages, I would go get my master's degree. You know. And what I think would be super cool would be to go through some of this, some of the actual book with him, showing these like dictionary uh, excerpts that he has, and showing where he's lining things up, how his process worked on some of these things. Pick like the top ten. Uh, yeah. characters that we think we know exactly where they came from and some of them from the Egyptian some of them from the Mayan influences it would be so cool and then we take him down to Koreatown and Chinatown and test his Korean and his Chinese that he claims to speak he did not claim you know? to speak Korean oh, come was... on. I think I read in there somewhere <laughs> Chinese you know and I'm Italian saying? okay but... <laughs> fine then I'm gonna freaking take him to Buca de Beppo you know what I'm saying <laughs> and if heck? he can't jive with the freaking waitress there that I know speaks Italian he's toast you know nice, and then nice. uh, you know I'm gonna take him to where there's some straight up Mandarin speaking you know business owners and I'm just gonna be like alright dude Tell him I want X, Y, or Z thing for you know A, B, or C amount of money. Oh and if God. he botches that transaction, I'm throwing him under the bus. No. <laughs> Dude, so the one thing, I, I, I just want to say at the very end of this, there is so much depth to this in what he's written in this book. He goes into like the not just the Mayan calendar and the way that that seems to appear in this character's document, but also the Nephite Jubilee and Festival calendar. Get out of town, really? Like, yeah. So, so there's this like, is stuff Don Bradley's talking about. Exactly. And new yeah. Research that's going into the lost 116 pages. Yeah. So there's really cool stuff and and stuff about like people's names really? and, that get referred to. Yeah. There's there's such fascinating stuff. So much depth to this. Um, that I think anybody who's interested in this needs to check out this character's document from Jerry Grover. Okay, and speaking of needing to check out things, um, I I totally just put two and two together right now, and I know you never le never shamelessly plug yourself. Oh yeah, but <laughs> since we're talking about deformed oh, no. English characters, I'm going to shamelessly plug you. You wrote this book, Dragon Guard. And it's a sequel to your first book, Dragon Thief, and it's crushing it. And it has its own, what I would call deformed English, but super cool Evgardian alphabet inside. If there's anybody that knows how to make up a language that's not inspired, it's you. That's right. right. And it's right I've done there. It. It's right there. And it's actually pretty cool because just yesterday, I saved this sticky note too. I had no idea it would come in handy. I put it on my cool typewriter. But you literally wrote, down my name and my wife's name in your Evgardian language right there, uh -huh. which is pretty cool. <laughs> and I got to tell you, Evgardian actually kind of looks a little bit more like the deformed English that anti-Mormons say. Exactly. You know <laughs> this is what that would look like. So yeah. uh, funny note about that. So um, my wife and I, when we were making up the language for our book, because I mean, who doesn't want a made up language in a fantasy book, right? Yeah, for real. It's what, like Klingon. Dude. Yeah. So what we did making up our own language is we wanted to make it something that people could like pass notes with pretty simply. Yeah. So we based it loosely on like Futhark runes. What English? What uh, it's it's what what's used by the. How nurse. did you get a wife that's so hot? I Guys know. that talk I like know. you, like uh, just there. <laughs> I I am blown away by that every <laughs> single day. So here's the thing: we we looked at the Futhark runes. There, we used a little bit of English to make it really really simple, so that you it was really similar to what you're writing. But we also um, changed enough that it is super different. I actually based it a little bit on some IPA stuff that Riley and I both studied as actors. It, it, did you ever do What's IPA IP stuff? No, and I never LARPed as Harry Potter either. Oh like, my gosh, no. I, IPA <laughs> is um, the International Phonetic Alphabet where oh. you have like some symbols referring to like where sounds are made in your mouth. Oh, so okay, I pulled cool, yeah. a little bit of that into the writing system. And then what's fascinating about this 
is I have an aunt who like works with a bunch of First Nations people up in Canada. And oh, when she saw on. this writing system, she's like, did you base this on Cree? And we're like, no, we didn't base it. I didn't even know what the Cree writing system was. But when we look into it, there's a bunch of things that look relatively similar. So it turns out a lot of writing systems are going to end up looking really similar. Yeah. So it's it's really fascinating. Really, really cool. Uh, the book is awesome. Uh, if you're a fantasy nerd, look into that. Dude, if you're bro, wanting bro, to learn more, you what? suck at self promotion. I know. Read, I, I I feel. L- I let feel me weird. read. Let me read this comic because I haven't read your book yet. Because you're like one of those guys that writes like five thousand page fantasy books. Actually, not five thousand. Uh, five hundred page fantasy books. But this is one of the best freaking reviews I've heard in my life. It says. If you haven't ventured in the world of Evgard yet, you're missing out on one of the most captivating fantasy realms ever. That's actually a verified customer on Amazon. And then one of the best sequels I have ever read. That Those are some two solid reviews that are impossible to get, bro. And you got them. Yeah. You should be proud, dog. You should call yourself what you are. You're an international bestseller. You've earned that right. <laughs> only technically, to- but yeah, technically, Dude, yes. dog... <laughs> I don't care if it's only technically it's happened and you're writing fake languages that are just from deformed English, unlike the character's document. Exactly. Which appears to be from all kinds of other cool crap, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and so. And so I just want to end this episode with my review of what I've read so far from Jerry Grover's book. This is such a cool, deep dive into what the character's document says, what we can learn about it with Egyptian and Mayan influences, and then what that can tell us about what the Nephites thought and believed and how they wrote things down. Super cool. I'm super excited to read more into this. I would love to talk with Jerry Grover on this because he seems like a super stand-up guy. Every interview that I've seen him on and everything that he's writing on Reddit seems to be like he's super open about this. He's just wanting to get it out there so that people can test it, see if it's right, and see what we can learn moving forward. Dude, awesome. This is awesome. This is great. All right. Well, for this and more, please check us out on wardradio.com. Hey, guys. Thanks for watching the video. Before you go, please make sure that you like the video, share it with your friends, and if you haven't subscribed yet, please let this be the video in which we earn your subscription and that you press the alert button so you're alerted to all of our fun live streams and standalone videos and community posts. Also, if you'd like to help us out, please consider joining the channel. Members get all kinds of cool perks and benefits. They get early access to a lot of our videos and special emoticons and emojis during our live streams and preferential treatment there. It's a lot of fun speaking of a lot of fun we have a super cool discord if you'd like to join our discord check us out on wardradio.com there's a link to the discord there also you can sign up there for our newsletter our newsletter is a lot of fun and you can put your email address in there and if you'd like to contribute to the program please consider looking us up on venmo or on the cash app we're on both of those platforms also If you just want to keep watching more content right about here and probably right about here are going to be some more videos. Please check those out. And as always, for this and more, please make sure that you look us up and check us out at wardradio.com. This is what it's like to be one of the best. Moving to the beat, feel the song in my chest. Yeah, you know we turning up, never settling for less. Like, woo, gotta go big to make a statement. Stomp your feet.